you end up with this kind of a curve where yield is maximized about half of virgin biomass, but you have a very strong density dependence. It's maximized often below 20% of, of unfished biomass. That's interesting. This thing cuts off. That might cause some trouble. So if we then plot the region where you get 80% of maximum yield, the region of pretty good yield, it's a big place, okay? And from the point of view of succeeding at single species management, and I think most people would be happy if, how many people would be happy if we got single species management right enough, we got 80% of the potential yield? Hmm, not as many as I thought, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, if you just move your eye across, uh, from low density dependence to high density dependence, anywhere from 0.3 to 0.5, 30% to 50% of virgin biomass will give you pretty good yield. And so a priori, you could say, well, if you're a, if you're a fish hawk and you say, let's fish hard, let's just fish down to 30%. If you're, if you're, a, if you're a, a, a dove, fishing dove, and you say, no, let's, let's not fish much. And if you're interested in minimizing ecosystem impacts, say, look, why don't we just aim for 50% of virgin biomass as a target? We're going to get pretty good results across almost every imaginable fish life history. Um, and in fact, I think that, that, that that's probably a really good rule of thumb in any new fishery saying, let's, you know, let's aim for 50% depletion. Um, you're going to get pretty good yield, and you're, not, and, and you're going to have quite a bit less impact on the ecosystem than if you were fishing quite a bit harder than that, or fish, fishing stocks down more than that. Uh, if you do the same thing across um, natural ratio of harvest rate to natural mortality rate, it isn't as robust, but for most marine fish have steepnesses out here. And you know, a good rule of thumb is fishing mortality rate equals natural mortality rate. It'll get you, it'll, it'll get you there. Um, I think was it Jake and your talk, you're talking about but that, 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 you, that a lot of places went to two times. And you see that two times, you've got to have a pretty productive stock to do very well with two times the natural mortality rate. And in this part of the world, we have, tend to have some pretty unproductive stocks. Half of the natural mortality rate's a common uh, target. So the key point is that ecosystem benefits in the sense of less fishing can be achieved at very little cost to single species yields. And also, as uh, both of the Australian speakers talked about, you know, in Australia, they've, they've just put in this rule of thumb, let's, let, let's, let's use 20% extra biomass as a concession to, to maximum economic yield. And, uh, and, 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 and ecosystem benefits and economic optimization tend to be congruent in this case. Let's fish less, won't lose much yield, do better with less ecosystem impact, and, and more profitability. Um, so now I want to move from sort of single species to what ecosystem models, and this is a slide from this working group that uh, I'm going to, actually Beth isn't there either because CSIRO officials wouldn't let her go because of the danger of swine flu, which is an interesting uh, thing. Uh, they, 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 she was at the airport when she got called back by her administrators and said, nope, it's too risky. Um, let's see, this, this, is a, this is a little, is one of these things, uh, the red, the red one in the middle. So Ray, does that mean that Tony and, uh, is a sacrificial lamb, or what? <laughs> Tony believes in adaptive management, and if he gets six months. Tony can't go home. OK. Um, so this looks a lot, this is a, a graph that Beth produced based on the average of 20 different ecosim ecopath models, um, looking at the uh, ecosystem-wide exploitation rate of, this is just a fish, we're not doing invertebrates in this particular run, of the yield as a function of the proportion of the total biomass that's harvested. And what she found across average was that about 40 to 50% exploitation rate produces the maximum ecosystem yield of fish. That's it. That might, might be a little surprisingly a little high, uh, but remember, I think Jake was showing, or some, maybe it was, um, um, someone else was showing that in Europe they used to run out here more, more commonly. Um, anyway, uh, but uh, again, there's, there's a, a broad range of pretty good yield. Look at this. Pretty good yield would go from 20% exploitation rate to 70%. Very broad range of worry. And obviously, ecosystem impacts, total system fish biomass declines right with exploitation rate. So you can get pretty good yield at say here, which would give you 70% of, of, of unfished biomass across the ecosystem, or you can get the same yield out here where you're getting about 20%. And 
traditionally in most, particularly Atlantic fisheries that have been around for a long time, we did tend to operate out here and down here. And in fact, I think still most, most European stocks are probably on average uh, somewhere down in the 20% of virgin biomass uh, range. Um, of particular interest here, this is, the, this is the proportion of stocks, of fish stocks, that would be expected to be what we called collapsed, that is less than 10% of their unfished biomass. So at your, uh, ecosystem opt optimum, you've got somewhere between uh, like 40% of the species in the ecosystem would be severely depleted. Now, if you take our traditional legislative mandate, maximum sustained yield, say, operate here, and but there are big consequences. You've got fewer fish, and you've got a lot of stocks that are hammered. And uh, again, uh, sharks and rays are an obvious one that gets that gets gets hammered early on. But you can move from out here, where we've in many systems operated, to over here at very little loss in yield and much less ecosystem impact. Oops. So ecosystem models suggest, A, there are a lot of options that, again, if you're just worried about yield, the traditional objective, uh, within the range of good yields, there's a lot of trade-offs. Uh, but those trade-offs are strong. And uh, where you want to be depends upon your objectives. And so several of the speakers talked about how um, the ecosystem objectives are very hard to get defined. Uh, but there are some really severe trade-offs. If you want no overfish stocks, you have to give up most of the yield. And I know Andre and I did a paper at the Moat Symposium 10 years ago, a fair while ago, where we looked at the California current ground fish and concluded you had to give up 90% of the yield to have no overfish stocks. That's a, that's a, that's a lot. And, and the other point is that ecosystems that are fished will be transformed. They are not the same. Abundance will be lower. There will be fewer large fish. And those are just unavoidable trade-offs. There is certainly a lot of room for technical improvement to make that trade-off less, less strong. Uh, I'll, I can't remember if I'm going to talk about that. But a uh, key point is that ecosystem benefits are easy to achieve, that, there are, that, that there's a little cost to getting a fair amount of ecosystem benefits, but then it gets harder and harder, more expensive. You have to give up more yield in the, in the simple-minded. If you really want to, if you really want to not have anything depleted, you really have to give up a lot. Um, so I just want to pose an interesting question: How many stocks should be overfished? Okay. What's the right answer? Um, first, they, if you if you were if you were managing every stock perfectly independently to maximize MSY, you would have some stocks that would be overfished due to management imprecision. You know, it simply would not make sense to collect enough data to make sure that everything was bang on. Because remember, the costs of going to the left and the right of that, of that target are not particularly high. Um, natural variability would push you down there. I think Liz Clark can tell you and, and about, about uh, Pacific Hake. And uh, you know, they're highly variable. They're, I think at the current rate, the, the numbers uh, she and Andre were touting the other day is they would expect the stock to be classified as overfished 40% of the time if it was being maximized for maximum sustained yield. Um, you may wish to deliberately deplete some stocks to increase yields of target stocks. And I'll, I'm going to leave that out there as, you know, is that what some people mean by ecosystem management? But to me, it certainly is, is on the table. Um, and then you will also have some stocks that would be overfished uh, by unavoidable bycatch, depending upon your objective. But it would take a very, uh, I think that's probably the next slide, yeah. The ecosystem model suggests that the answer is not zero unless you basically place no value on sustained yield. That you're, you're in any system managed for most reasonable social objectives, some of your stocks will be overfished. Right, the US is down to about, is it under 20 now this year, Rick, do you know? It's about 20% are classified as overfished in, 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 in the US. About 20%. It's about, it's about 20? About 20. Yeah, that's what I thought, yeah, about 20%, okay. So I just wanted to then, just a sort of a reality check on, on how we were doing. And this is sort of, this is a, a, from an NGO website looking at the, ca at the California current fishery. That is, you know, it was declared a disaster in 2000. It's 2002, seven stocks were overfished. There'd been a 45% decline in abundance. Here's the, the abundance trend of, of all the major stocks in the California uh, groundfish system. 
that is started out largely unexploited in 1950. Here is the 30 to 50 percent target where you would maximize yield. It barely got into that range. This is when it was declared a disaster. Now, that, that was an economic disaster. You had seven of these smaller stocks hit the overfished boundary at, at various times. But from, from a yield perspective, this, this stock was never fished hard enough to even get in the region of maximum sustained ecosystem yield. If you do the arithmetic stock by stock and weight it by value, this is the post percentage of the of the potential yield. This is the value if they were at MSY. And you just do the addition. This was, I did this about two years ago. You get that the, that the overfishing in the system was costing about 3% of yield. So again, with the objective of yield, the system was never really poorly, poorly managed by, by any definition. And this is a graph that Mike Fogarty made up. Um, of all U.S. fisheries, and on the x-axis is a B current over BMSY, so below here, you were below the target, and, and by the old U.S. overfishing definitions, below 0.5 would be classified as overfished. So you still have a fair number of overfished stocks. This isn't all U.S. assessed stocks, but it's the ones he had. And this is F uh, over FMSY, and so the, and the, we call this the fried egg plot. It sort of shows you where the mass of the data are, and you see right now, on average, American stocks are fished well under FMSY and, uh, and are now just about at BMSY. It's a way of system by system looking at, at status. Um, so now I'm going to turn to fine tuning a little bit. Um, the kind of fine tuning we heard about here consists really of, uh, of three things. Of first, doing uh, studying a lot more about ecosystems. And the, the, first, the first thing that, again, I've lost track of, Simon or someone mentioned, is going out and looking at stomachs, OK? They have another year of the stomach around the world, OK? Uh, ecosystem modeling. And then generally, the fine tuning involves modification of single species control rules based on ecosystem understanding. That's what we've mostly heard about. But then I want to pose the question, is this fine tuning worth the cost? Okay. Because first, this is very expensive. As Rose, Rosie said, you know, New Zealand's a small country. It can't afford it. And on top of that, they, the most of the, a, a very high portion of those costs are paid right, right from, from, the, from the fishing industry. I mean, the US, we have the government, the federal government basically pay, pays all these costs, and the taxpayers are remarkably compliant. Um, but it is not definitely expensive. The objectives are uncertain. And thus, there's really no guidance on what you should actually do. And if you don't appreciate that, just come to an MLPA process in California. Uh, the law gives no guidance on what proportion of the area should be put in reserves. You could interpret the law to mean 100% or 0%. Uh, not 0%. Zero, 0% zero wouldn't work. That's true. Um, but it's, it's also very expensive. In fact, California couldn't, have, uh, couldn't pay for the process. And so it's being paid for by environmental foundations. Because the government did not have the money to pay for. When you start dealing with, with vested stakeholders on the fine scale, you, that you have hundreds of meetings uh, at, at enormous expense. Um, and another problem that's really emerging in California right now is the data aren't there. Liz mentioned it earlier. Um, where if science has made up all these things, you've got to have so much of this habitat, so much of that habitat. Well, it turns out we don't know how much we have. So how can you decide where to put your protected areas if you don't know where the kelp is or where the hard bottom is? It's proving to be a very serious problem. Um, the financial benefits, in, in terms of strict cost-benefit analysis, uh, the, the, the fine-tuning isn't going to take you nearly as far as getting single species management right. And this is one I got uh, an idea Selena gave me just a little while ago. And that is, you know, is this really the best allocation of, of the resources we have, given all the demands for, for, um, for uh, catch quotas by species, et cetera? Is this really the best? If you, would, would, the, would the omniscient manager decide that paying for all of these meetings associated with a lot of the fine tuning or all the expensive science is really the best investment in the fishery management system? And I think. That's an, that's an issue that, that someone should address. Um, this really, you can think of two, two futures. Now, I think almost everybody here in the panel yesterday asked us about really agreed that we're not going the second route. What we're really going to do is use ecosystem models to modify single species management strategies. And the two, I think, obvious ways that those will kick right in is first, lower Fs on forage species, which a number of people talked about actually doing within, within their, uh, their systems. And then the other one that I, I don't think anyone's mentioned, but 
is, is if you add up the estimated unfished biomass from single species assessments and then plug that into ecosystem models, it's almost always unrealistically high. Every species could not uh, be at what is thought to be the virgin biomass because the virgin biomass calculations are all based on the assumption of the same somatic growth and a whole bunch of things that obviously when you get to higher densities uh, change. Um, and it seems unlikely that, that we're going to move in the not too distant future, in the, in, the, in the near future, to having ecosystem based control rules using ecosystem models with ecosystem indicators. Um, so let's look a little bit at the practice. Uh, the core elements of ecosystem based management I talked about are actually widely accepted, reasonably inexpensive, and, uh, uh, and I think almost every uh, agency we heard from is moving that way if they're, if they're not there yet. Uh, the more complex trade-offs are questions of objectives, depend upon local circumstances, and require a great deal of consultation, science, including data, and cost. Um, if we look at what's happened as we've institutionalized single species management, uh, there's been a number of things that are what I would call uh, counterintuitive consequences of simple, sen sensible guidelines. One example is, uh, is, is choosing overfishing levels that turn out to, when you do the biology, are greater than the level that produces maximum sustained yield. So at the overfishing level, they aren't even fully fished. And that would be the case for, uh, say, a number of flatfish on the West Coast, where the, uh, the estimates from the stock assessments are that the BMSY is lower than the overfishing level. I think that um, some of the, uh, there, there, are other, there are other examples. Um, one of the more interesting ones was uh, when, when the Pacific Fishery Management Council first got into rebuilding plans, people put down some rules of thumb, and when Andre started analyzing it, turned out that the, the TAC would be higher if the stock was more depleted. Uh, and that's because you would say, okay, if, if the stock is a little bit depleted, then you have to have a faster recovery time. And once you just do all the algebra, you ended up with some counterintuitive consequences. Um, when we're, you know, the whole idea of setting uh, catch limits on, on every species in the system is just, it's such a silly thing that uh, I hope we don't repeat that okay. in. <laughs> like, yeah, like the Magnuson Act, and, and I think the New Zealand Fisheries Act is also takes us there. I um, want to say a little bit about risk analysis, again, coming out of Jake's, the idea of misses, ignoring overfishing as opposed to false, uh, false alarms where you, where you declare overfishing. Um, I would say if you actually do the arithmetic, uh, we've paid a lot higher cost for false alarms than we have for misses in general. Now, Jake talked about the $4 billion uh, in, in, in Newfoundland, and that definitely uh, was, a, was, a, was a high cost. But if you, uh, if you average across, if you, well, if you, if you count the number of cases where we've had big costs for, uh, um, let me just talk a, in the last couple minutes, a, a couple issues about uh, where ecosystem management is going. And one of them is, is ecosystem transformation an acceptable form of ecosystem-based management? Uh, if you, it's not according to the Marine Stewardship Council criteria. You know, that's one of the things, that the fishery does not transform the ecosystem. Now, I'm all for ecosystem transformation in some places at such times. This is a, this is a, a vineyard in New Zealand. I guarantee you, this is not what it used to look like, okay? In fact, well, it was a sheep pasture before this, but, but 500 years ago, it did not look like this. Now, we have made this decision in almost all of terrestrial management to transform ecosystems. And I guarantee, you know, when, when Boris Worms and Company's paper came out, you, uh, in, in 06, uh, uh, the, 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 forget the official ground by 2048. You know, the basic assertion was that maintaining diversity increases productivity. And I said, well, that's counter to my terrestrial experience. That um, I, I went to college in Iowa, and they did not cut native grasses to produce the maximum yield from those fields. They planted corn. Um, and I, and I, I think there are probably uh, a disturbing number of cases where that might be true in marine ecosystems. This is a large selfish farm in China. Okay. I would say that that produces a lot more human goods and services than that ecosystem would have done before it was transformed. Uh, and you know, and, 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 and a lot, of, a lot of, of Asia intertidally is starting to look like that. Um, now, in Puget Sound, you try to do anything even close to that, and you have, you have 10 years of consultative practice, uh, consultation. Um, 
So, uh, but the, so the solution to this transformation issue to me is, I, I guess I should have changed the word from zoning, but that's what, uh, that's one of the few things that Elliot Norse and I really agree on, is we do need to move to ocean zoning, and I'm sure it's going to involve some portion of protected areas and some highly transformed areas. There can be a lot of battles over how much of each, but it's gonna happen. Uh, but these costs can be great. So, so Mary mentioned Puget Sound. Shellfish and salmon farms, oh my God, you talk about the time and energy it takes to actually deal with those issues, and the same thing would be true of the MLPA in California. Um, last issue I want to talk about is adding people as part of the ecosystem, because, uh, and that comes in two ways. One is, is, is people as dynamic elements of the, of the managed system, and as people, uh, just the, the fact that we're generally trying to get human goods and services out of the ecosystems as one of the products. Um, uh, a lot of us work up in Bristol Bay, which is generally regarded as one of the best managed fisheries in the world since the late 1970s. Yields have been at record levels, and have total return, and the number of fish, uh, number of fish spawning. Um, but in, in terms of the humans interacting, this is a typical Bristol Bay boat in uh, the 1970s. Uh, in order to prevent the overcapitalization of the fleet, and they limited boats to 32 feet. So this is another 32-foot boat, okay? You notice the bow is cut off, and it's a little bit bigger. Um, and but, and, and the, the fish, so what's happened is the fleet has been transformed from boats that look like that to boats that look like that with absolutely no benefit in the increased catch. The same number of fish were caught in the 1930s by sailboats, okay? So almost all of, you know, this is just your classic dynamics, what the economist calls capital stuffing. Um, that, that, and, and, and you know, we, we pretty well know about this now, and a lot of the man fishery management efforts are, are devoted to trying to keep it from happening, but um, it's, it's, it's one way that humans interact in the ecosystem. Uh, in this fishery, which in the, about 2000 was declared an economic disaster, not a biological disaster, but an economic disaster, and here's the reason that in 1989, one sockeye salmon and a, and a middling boat might catch 20,000 of them, okay? Might catch 20,000 sockeye salmon and they were worth a barrel of oil. Every fish. 2003, they were worth a Big Mac. <laughs> how, how many people would prefer 20,000 Big Macs to 20,000 barrels of oil? <laughs> Aren't they the same? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you'd be safer drinking oil. <laughs> now, this I mean the whole economics of the fishery has been the subject of a lot of discussion, but Alaska's current policy is still sort of like Eastern Canada's policy. It's really about employment rather than about making money. And so they, uh, they, they, the policy is to maximize the number of owner operators. So tools that have been used in other fisheries, uh, such as cooperatives, where you can reduce costs, catch the same number of fish, get a higher price, pay less in fuel, they've actually been ruled illegal in, in Alaska. Um, and so this is, I mean, I, I don't have solutions for this. So this is obviously you're into the realm of governance, et cetera. Um, this is a graph I just, uh, in response to Jake's, uh, where, where did the $4 billion go? This is the value of fish products landed in Eastern Canada starting in 1989, where it was a little under a billion dollars, and it has it, it increased consistently, you know, with, well, I would call this a consistent increase, uh, since then. The ground fish collapse start, was right in here in 1991. The northern cod fishery was closed in July 1st of 92, right? And uh, I still use a video of John Crosby uh, that famous CBC video in my undergraduate class. Uh, but, so there was no drop in revenue from the fishery, and yet taxpayers like Jake ended up paying $4 billion. And, and the basic reason is because of the way we structured the fisheries. We forced people to be cod fishermen or shellfish fishermen, so whereas in the 40s or, or 30s, if there had been a decline in ground fish, they would have switched, they couldn't switch. And so you had 40,000 people, 20,000 people on the, uh, basically unemployed with no, with no options. Um, again, ecosystem-based management has to consider these kinds of things. So second to last slide, oh, it doesn't all show. That's too bad. Um, God, it doesn't even all show on my, uh, on my screen. <laughs> um, this is a quote from Garstown, 1900, that this is not a new problem, that uh, 
face the established fact that bottom fisheries are not only exhaustible, but in a rapid and continuous process of exhaustion. Um, and so the question is, you know, if we don't get fisheries management right, this is going to be where we end up with a, with, uh, a lot of boats that look like that. So I want to conclude with the idea that some of this is pretty simple. Fisheries management isn't rocket science, okay? It's actually harder. How long did it take them to solve the shuttle problems and get them flying again? About two or three years, I don't know. I mean, some of us have been doing this for 40 years, some probably even longer, and we're making progress, but it's actually slow because it's not an engineering problem, it's a human, it's a human problem, it's an ecological problem, and it's a lot harder. So, thanks very much. I'm sure Ray would be happy to entertain a few questions before he runs off to the airport. Mm -hmm. had decided that uh, a, a, a very valuable stock, a joint recreational commercial stock, Snapper, Snapper One, which is actually a Seabreed, uh, that it needed to be rebuilt, which to BMSY, which was about doubling, and the, the, it's a very long-lived fish. The estimate was it would take 40% catch reduction for 20 years. Okay, that's, that's painful. And this was a fishery where the, it's an ITQ fishery, and that the, the value of 40%, market value of 40% of the quota was, I believe, $200 million, okay? So what the government said is, we're going to take $200 million out of your assets, we'll get it back to you, if our models are right, in 20 years, and in the end, you'll get 8% more. So I, how many people would take a 40% pay cut to get a 20%, uh, an 8% pay rise in 20 years? I mean, from a, from a fisherman's perspective, that is a silly trade-off. And that's the problem. That's one of the reasons that fishermen oppose many rebuilding plans is because they know enough to know that you're going to see higher biomass, but you're not going to see higher yields. Now, that's not always the case. If you take a lot of, uh, of cod stocks, that's not true at all. The benefits are really there. But in a lot of other stocks, it isn't. And, uh, you know, we basically, at least in the U.S., made the decision it's going to happen whether you like it or not. And that's, you know, it's basically what's happening on the west coast of, 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 of the U.S. Yeah, um, I mean, one thing I noticed about the, the analysis, and actually I'd say uh, a lot of the lots here today is this really looks at a range of species, even in an ecosystem context, which either we, we uh, agree that we want to set targets for, or that we say, okay, they're bycatch species, we can accept a large amount of mortality. But what about the, the furry and the feathery things? Um, I'm wondering how these sorts of models and analysis when you then enter a world where even a single thought of a depleted stock is in the name of species territory puts you in, in the territory of also the conservation-minded idea that no depletion is accepted. And how, well, how well okay, there's, 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 there's two issues there. One is bycatch. And again, you know, those problems are quite often pretty solvable. Okay. I think the more the trickier one is trophic impacts on uh, you know and and that's where you get into the complications of ecosystem-based management and uh, 
and, and really worrying about, you know, what is the impact of fishing on the, on stellar sea lions? And if, you know, thankfully, that lots of Norwegians had lots of money, and they know the answer to that. <laughs> I, guess, I guess the question is, just, do you think that, that those sorts of very strong interactions still fit within the Fabian-Neal construct, or are we going to have to go even? Oh, I think they, 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 that, 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 you know, in the U.S. context, they dominate, they, they, they trump single species issues. You know, you simply have to comply with the law on those things. And, and, but now, a lot, some of those problems would be solved by just moving to the lower fishing mortality rates. You know, if you go back to that ecosystem graph, graph of best, you can go from a 70% rate to a 20% rate and give up much less, uh, I mean, give up very little yield. In fact, for about the same yield, they're all within that 80% range. And you're fishing one third as much, which means every, you know, the biomass, it would, it would be going from uh, ecosystem biomasses that would be quite depleted to ecosystem biomasses of, uh, that would be much, much less depleted. But, you know, again, it, it, and it's, good, it's totally culturally dependent. I guarantee you that uh, in Iceland, they wouldn't worry about the furry and feathery things <laughs> quite as much as they, do, as they do here. George. I think one of the things about furry and feathery is that the public worries about individuals. So every individual that gets killed is, is a catastrophe. Whereas if you, as a biologist or a fisheries man, you think at a population level, and for many of the species, of oh, birds at least, and I suspect mammals as well, they can sustain a considerable amount of bycatch without it hurting their populations. It's not true for all, but for a lot it is. But the, the social side of it is a focus on individuals, which is not a biological issue, it's a societal issue. Yeah, but, but in fact, I mean, that is, you know, the, we, the science of what can in theory tell us what the trade-offs are, but society has to make a decision. So, you know, as I said, one decision would be to stop fishing. And, and some societies may make that choice. US is probably the closest to it at the moment. Um, and, uh, but, that, that, you know, that's, that's, it's neither right nor wrong. That's just what a society wants to do. And, you know, I think in the US, what we're going to look for is as much spatially varying policies to try to get or have our cake and eat it, too. Um, and I suspect other places will follow along that, that. Andre. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you, pay, pay, you painted an important picture, which is within, although we're a disaster, everything's wrong here in the US and Australia and New Zealand, the reason you're, you're painting the fine-tuning picture is we're actually, all of those countries are at the sort of top end of being able to do single species assessments. I think you're about somewhat deliberately or unintentionally, I'm not sure. Uh, but yet, and yet, we still see ourselves as a long way away from the EBFM goal. Um, the question I have is, outside of those three regions of the world, perhaps Europe, what is EBFM 